When we come back, we're going to go straight to my interview, which I had this afternoon with nuclear physicist Michio Kaku to talk about the nuclear power plant and their disaster uh, risks in Japan. We'll see you at the end of the break. Star Talk Radio, our special Violent Earth edition inspired by the tragedy in Japan. We're going to go straight to an interview that I had with Michio Kaku, professor of physics, City University of New York, to chat about Japan and the nuclear risks that are now posed by the damage to the reactor. Check it out. So, Michio, when we think of nuclear power, there's fusion, there's fission, but all power plants in the world are fission, right? That's right. Fusion power is the engine of the universe. It's what drives the stars, the galaxy, all of it, because we fuse hydrogen to create helium. But on the Earth, as far as we can tell, only on the Earth do we use uranium. So instead of fusing the atoms of hydrogen, we split the atom of uranium. Now, believe it or not, Mother Nature does not use fission. Only in bombs and nuclear power plants do we use fission. In the whole universe. Could be. Uh, there's only one naturally occurring reactor that we think can go back to uh, paleo times, but other than that, we see no example of a naturally occurring fission process. So we know all of all these sort of bad byproduct of fission, and this is the physics of the nuclear bombs, but so why don't we just use fusion? Is it because we don't know how to control it yet? Well, it's relatively easy to create a fission plant because uranium will split up all by itself. So you do nothing, and then you can get a fission process going. Of course, you have to purify it. Fusion, on the other hand, you have to concentrate with enormous pressures and temperatures to get the fusion process going. That's why Mother Nature can do it, because gravity is for free in outer space. Hey, you get gas, you compress it, boom, bingo, you got a star. When I was in high school, by the way, my advisor was one of the founders of this nuclear energy, uh, Edward Teller. Nuclear energy, he said, does not belong on the surface of the Earth. It belongs underground. Because if it's underground and you have a tsunami, you simply put the manhole cover on it and walk away. Now, the fundamental difference between fusion and fission as far as health and safety are concerned is that fusion is clean. Helium gas is actually commercially valuable. Hydrogen to helium, very clean, very little nuclear waste. Helium is the byproduct of fusion going on in the sun every day of the week. But fission creates fission products. In other words, you split the uranium atom, you get cesium, strontium, iodine, all the radioactive products that come spewing out of a nuclear accident. And these very same chemicals can be absorbed into the body in bad ways. That's right. Take a look at the thyroid gland. The thyroid gland can absorb iodine-131 with a half-life of eight days and give you thyroid cancer. In fact, thyroid cancer was one of the main byproducts, health byproducts, of the Chernobyl accident. People drank milk. Iodine occurs in water-soluble form, gets into the milk, concentrates in the thyroid gland. Strontium-90 concentrates in the bone marrow. And cesium-137 will concentrate throughout the body. The half-life of strontium and cesium are about 30 years. And that means that if you ingest this into your bones and your muscle, your body will become radioactive and will be radioactive for centuries. Long after you're dead, your grave will be radioactive. Japan is no stranger to national disaster. They've been in an earthquake zone ever since the culture set foot there. There's also, of course, the nuclear bomb blast from 1945. And there's no shortage of the films that show Godzilla and other sort of creatures leveling cities. So can you comment on how well Japan is taking this? In the Japanese language, we have something called gaman, that is, uh, suffer quietly. And that's what they've done throughout their history. Uh, 1923, the entire city of Tokyo was leveled. 140,000 people died in that massive Kanto earthquake. And, yeah, you live with it. Every time I go to Tokyo, you kind of feel the, the earth shake underneath your feet. And so you realize that uh, even though we have satellites in outer space and we can see in outer space, we cannot even see an inch below your own feet. You can't predict them. There's no way to x-ray the earth. And as a consequence, we're children when it comes to predicting earthquakes. My view on this is the disasters thus far doesn't seem to be much worse than anything that's happened before, such as in Chernobyl. Is this a day to celebrate how safe Japan has made itself in the face of what it knew would be ultimate disasters? Well, some people think that the situation is, quote, stable. Well, that's like hanging in there on a cliff on your fingernails. Yes, it's stable. But if your fingernails start to break or start to get tired, uh, you are toast. And so that's the situation here that as long as the radioactive byproducts don't penetrate the containment, then you're okay, like Three Mile Island. 
Three Mile Island was the Class 5 accident. 90% of the core disintegrated, but the vessel held the radioactive material. The vessel intended to do that by design. That's right. In fact, the rods, which are very clean and vertical, looks like a box. At Three Mile Island, when they opened up the reactor to photograph the state of the core, they found that it looked like a bowl of granola, totally fragmented and disintegrated. But nonetheless contained. But contained. Now, we think that this accident is class six in the sense that it's contained but seeping out. Not explosively, but just through... Steam explosions and and hydrogen gas explosions. Uh, Zirconium interacts with water to create hydrogen gas. You light a cigarette, you light a switch, and boom, you have hydrogen gas explosion. And we had three of them in Japan. Many people thought those explosions were radioactive... It was a Uh, chemical explosion, explosion. but it blew the roof right off the containment structure. And at Chernobyl, we had a Class 7 accident, an accident that ruptured not just the core, not just the vessel, but the building itself, and shot about 25% of the fission products right into the air, into people's backyard. And all I'm saying is that Chernobyl, it was unprovoked by nature. Right. And Chernobyl, it was human error. Uh, People disengaged the scram safety mechanism. And meanwhile, in Japan, that plant's been around since the early 70s, right? That's right. It's a very old 1971 design, the Mark I General Electric Boiling Water Reactor. So why doesn't the reactor just cool down all by itself? What, What is driving the heat source that puts it at risk of melting? A nuclear meltdown is forever, in the sense that you have all this nuclear waste. Once you shut off the chain reaction... Power is reduced by 90%, but it's that last 10% of power that lasts for tens of thousands of years, and that causes the meltdown. It's called decay heat. Decay heat very slowly goes away, but that decay heat, the 10% of the original power, is enough to melt the containment, is enough to blow the entire reactor apart, and we saw that at Chernobyl. So this is the heat that it would generate on its own. Right. People say, well, why didn't they simply hit the off switch, right? Why didn't they simply turn it off? You cannot turn off mother nature. You cannot turn off nuclear fission. So once you scram the rods, that is, you stop the chain reaction, decay heat keeps on going for for an extended period of time. At Chernobyl, do you know that it's still hot at Chernobyl? That was a 1986 explosion. When it rains, water seeps into the sarcophagus of concrete, heats up, the chain reaction slowly builds up again. Water is an excellent source of coolant. So what's the problem? There's no shortage of water, obviously, especially in the face of a tsunami. Think of driving a car. The car is out of control. What do you do? You hit the brakes. But the brakes don't work. Then the radiator starts to overheat, and the radiator explodes. So your brakes don't work, the radiator explodes, and then your gas tank is about to catch on fire. What do you do? You head for the river. The river will cool down the car, cool down the radiator, and make sure that you don't explode. Well, that's what's happening at the reactor site. First, the emergency core cooling system didn't work because the tsunami knocked it out. No brakes. Then a hydrogen gas bubble blew up the containment structure, blowing up your radiator. And then what they do? They pump seawater into the reactor site. Next best thing available. Right, like driving it into the river. But the problem is that it is away from the oceans. You have to pump it in. There's no electricity. The pumps don't work. The generators don't work. And the crew there is being reduced from 800 people down to 50. You're talking about essentially a suicide squad that know that they could get a lethal dose. So there's not enough manpower to make sure that seawater is covering everything, even as the seawater boils off. But I tell you, at a certain point, even they will leave. And at that point, we'll have to abandon ship. And when you abandon ship, you're going to have three meltdowns right in a row. That's the nightmare scenario. And the spent fuel pond, which is adjacent to the three reactors, is open to the sky. There's no cover. There's no vessel. It's just an open swimming pool of hot rods containing more waste than in the core of a nuclear power plant. Hollywood likes to focus in on the core, the meltdown. But it is the lowly waste dump that could actually cause the most damage. And that's what is now separating President Obama from the Japanese prime minister. President Obama's people are saying, hey, you got no water on that spent fuel pond. It could explode. It's dangerous. And the Japanese government is saying, no, 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 things are stable. Well, I think the meltdown that we are seeing is the meltdown of the credibility of the Japanese government. So what is the future of nuclear fission? Well, the future of nuclear fission is a Faustian bargain. Um, Faust was the mythical figure who sold his soul to the devil for unlimited power. And nations like Japan that have no coal, oil reserves are reaching for this Faustian bargain. The price you pay is you have a tremendous amount of fission products which are quite hot. 
These fission products can be released in a nuclear accident, and as a consequence, you have to take care of your nuclear power plants very carefully if you undergo the Faustian bargain. But now, in light of this Japanese accident, many nations, including Germany, are rethinking the Faustian bargain. Unlimited power, the only price is your soul. One of the problems Japan also faces is where it is located geographically on Earth. It's part of the ring of fire. So if they're trying to make their own energy without the natural resources of coal and oil, and they do it by nuclear, then they've got a nuclear power plant on fault zones. That's right. 90% of all earthquakes on the Earth are in the Pacific ring of fire. It's the same uh, fault line that leveled San Francisco in 1906. My grandfather was in that earthquake. He was part of the cleanup operation. It leveled Tokyo in 1923. It's caused some of the greatest tragedies in human history, the Pacific Ring of Fire. So your family and ancestry has been in the United States for more than a century then. That's right. About 100 years my family's been here. But we have relatives in Japan. And one of the things that our relatives are debating right now is whether to evacuate. For good. Uh, well, until they can bring the reactor under control and until they can make sure that there's no contamination. However, at Chernobyl, realize that some of the land will be a dead zone for maybe centuries to come because you have to multiply the half-life by 10 before it becomes relatively safe. So Chernobyl released cesium and strontium, half-lives of around 30 years. So in 300 years, parts of Chernobyl area will be usable. So that's where the radiation level goes below what people have determined to be safe. So that's right. Mm -hmm. In fact, you have a piece of Chernobyl in your body. I have a piece of Chernobyl in my body, of course, in a microscopic form, but it circled the Earth, and the radiation from Japan is not dangerous to the United States, but it is already in the United States. That was my interview with Michio Kaku just this afternoon. He was kind enough to give me a few minutes between sessions for his book tour for Physics of the Future, How Science Will Shape Human Destiny and Our Daily Lives by the Year 2100. When we come back, we'll march straight into Tsunami. See you then. 